Welcome back to the Information Security Managers course. Through this section, we're going to start dealing with the overall strategy of information security. Uh, we'll start looking at some different models to handle the governance aspects, and we'll look at some of the pitfalls that we have to be aware of. Let's start with just a general overview of information security strategy. When it comes to developing the strategy, it is a family affair. Everyone must be involved, from the employees to middle and senior management, as well as the C-suite. Everyone has a role, and each of those roles are critically important to the strategy as a whole and to its success. As we begin to develop our strategy, what we're looking to do is to define what we call the desired state. What do we want the environment to ultimately look like? Now, to do this, we need to keep in mind that we're going to need to develop an action plan. And part of that action plan, we have to take into account the available resources and constraints that we have as we begin to build the strategy. We also need to make provision for monitoring and metrics to determine our levels of success. One definition of the information security strategy is a coherent and evolving portfolio of initiatives to drive a stakeholder value and long-term performance. This basic definition stays in line with everything we've already spoken about. A classic security architecture model is the SABSA model. Within the SABSA model, you have many different architectures all layered on top of each other. But we keep in mind all the interaction between each layer to create a holistic environment. Some of the common issues that we need to be aware of as our organization builds and develops our information security policy are overconfidence and optimism. Most people are overconfident in their own abilities and they think they look weak if they ask for help. Being overly optimistic about the starting posture versus what we think it looks like. We also need to be careful of a situation called anchoring. Uh, anchoring is when we're presented with, for instance, a set of numbers. We have a tendency to evaluate and evaluate all subsequent numbers based on the first number that we saw. This can be dangerous, especially when you're trying to get a complete picture of the environment. Next is the status quo bias. I think most of us can understand this. It's human nature to just kind of stick with what's familiar, with what makes us comfortable. Mental accounting is simply categorizing and treating money differently depending on where it comes from and where it is kept and how it is spent. The herding instinct. This often is coupled with the status quo. We don't want to go against the herd. We're constantly seeking validation from our peers. And finally, false consensus. You often hear a lot of senior managers uh, indicate that they seem to be living in a, in a glass cone. Uh, that's when there's a whitewash of all information as it goes up each individual layer of management until eventually it gets to senior management and they really don't have actionable information to make a decision on. Simply because no one wants to tell the boss no. So the core objective to developing an information security strategy includes defining our goal, defining our objectives, beginning to define our desired state and any risk objectives that we need to be aware of. So being the next step in the process, we look for the outcomes of security governance. Have we achieved strategic alignment, effective risk management? Have we achieved value delivery and process assurance integration? The answers to this question are important when we start to define and identify the goal of the information strategy as a whole. Some of our primary goals, of course, should be to protect the information assets themselves, locate and identify the current and relative information within the organization, assign value to each piece of that information, and evaluate the business dependency on that information. The higher the dependency, the higher the value. We also need to determine and define our overall objectives for information security. Locating and identifying these information assets can be time consuming and difficult. Uh, however, remember that is the true intrinsic value of the organization itself. We need to find these information assets so we can classify them. Each piece of data or knowledge uh, needs to be assigned a criticality and sensitivity. Some more common classifications would be uh, confidential or internal use, or public releasable, or top secret. 
Depending on the industry that you work in will depend on the classification labels that you use for your information. Once we've defined our goals, now we need to define our objectives. We need to begin to think about what is our desired state? What is our long-term objective for our environment? This is something that needs to be well articulated and have specific desired outcomes. Each one of our objectives should be stated in terms of specific goals, not generalities. As part of defining these objectives, we need to look at the business linkages. The easiest way is to start from the perspective of those specific objectives. However, you must take into consideration all information flows and what are the threats to that information. We often find by doing a thorough analysis of the business linkages, we uncover issues at the operational level that we didn't even know we had. When beginning to look at our desired state, we need to take into account all relevant conditions at a particular point in time. This includes the totality of the system, the people, the processes, and the technologies. Once we identify what that desired state is, it must be defined. We want to define this qualitatively, you know, that fuzzy feeling that you get on whether you like or dislike something based on its attributes. When doing this qualitative analysis, we want to make sure that the desired outcomes are defined as precisely as possible. That way we know the target that we're trying to hit. The strategy development will have limits and we need to understand those limits as we begin to mature the strategy itself. For instance, one of the methods to determine that desired state is COBIT, endorsed and developed by ISACA, has five key principles. We're going to go through each of them one at a time. The first principle is to ensure that we are meeting stakeholder needs. We want to make sure that we create value for the stakeholders by maintaining balance between realization of benefits and optimization of risk and use resources. Next, we want to ensure that we are providing coverage from end to end within the enterprise. COBIT does this by integrating governance of IT into enterprise governance. It covers covers all functions and processes. It covers all IT related governance and management enablers. The third principle of COVID is to apply a single integrated framework. We do this within COVID by aligning with other relevant standards and frameworks at a higher level. Our fourth principle is to enable a holistic approach. Uh, to do this, the COBIT framework defines seven categories of overall enablers. They're principles, policies, and frameworks, uh, processes, organizational structures, uh, culture, ethics, and behavior, information, services, infrastructure, and applications, and people, skills, and competency. And our fifth COVID principle is the separation of governance from management. Each has a role to play, but they're different in execution. Uh, governance is ensuring that stakeholder needs, conditions, and opinions are evaluated to determine balance and agreed upon enterprise objectives to be... Governance is ensuring that stakeholder needs, conditions, and options are evaluated to determine balance agreed upon enterprise objectives to be achieved, whereas management is the paying of the bills, the plans, the monitoring activities, all with the goal of alignment in mind with our sets of governance. A tool that we use to navigate towards our desired state is a process assessment model. Uh, the covert process assessment model is a two-dimensional model. Uh, the first dimension is the process, and the second dimension is the capability. Within the COVID process assessment model, as the process matures, the capability matures with it. And yes, it probably does look familiar. Uh, another process assessment model that is most commonly used is the CMM or the Capability Maturity Model. It has five defined levels. Uh, within those levels, you're dealing with process maturity at each level. As the organization and the process matures, you reach another level from initial all the way up to optimizing. 
Yet another tool that we can use is the balance scorecard. What the balance scorecard does is it helps to clarify our organizational vision and strategy and translate them into how we are going to act. It, it takes learning and growth, business processes, customers, and financial all into account to make sure that with every move and every decision, we understand who and what is being affected. Now, outside of some of these capability and maturity models, there are architectural approaches that we can take. Uh, the architectural approach is a subset of the complete enterprise architecture. Architectures like SAPSA and Zachman would be considered architectural approaches. Most organizations have moved to ISO certification. When you're dealing with ISO certification, and you should be familiar with the ISO 2701, which is the standard, and the ISO 2700 Two, which is the code of practice. Uh, the ISO 2700 has 11 major areas that you need to understand. Uh, security policy, organizing information security, asset management, uh, human resource security, uh, physical and environmental security communications and operations management, access control, information security, acquisition, development, and maintenance, uh, information security, incident management, uh, business continuity management, and compliance. Now that we've defined our desired state, we need to take a look at our risk objectives. A major input in defining the desired state will be the organization's approach to risk or their risk appetite. This risk appetite should be based on an analysis of cost to achieve our defined desired state. Now, one way a security manager can approach the acceptable risk question is by developing the RTOs or the recovery time objectives. However, we have found that it really is more effective and a lot less costly to look at the physical, the process, and the procedural controls to begin to identify the organization's risk appetite. Remember, faulty processes is what poses the greatest hazard to organizations. Technical controls really are unlikely to really address poor management. That's why we want to look at those process risks first. So, we've looked at our desired state and we've looked at some of our risk objectives. Now we need to identify our current state. To do so, we need to use the exact same methodology or combination of them as we did to determine our desired state. As you begin to identify your current state, you must keep in mind two things must occur to determine your current risk posture. First, a business impact analysis or assessment and a comprehensive risk assessment.